I don't fly much, but someone said that as you're sitting there at your gate and you're looking out and you people watch, because if you're like me, that's what you do, even though you're just watching and you're wondering, where are they from? What have they done? And if you have resting jerk face like me, it just looks like you're judging everybody, but you still people watch nonetheless. And he said, notice at the gate, see if you can identify those who have a ticket and who are on standby. See if you can tell by their demeanor, if you can tell who has the assurance that they have a ticket and those who are waiting. I'll be sure to do that next time in four years when I fly again. But let's go even further down this stream of assurance or confidence. If you're not familiar with these two men, I recommend that you look into them. Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. Now, there are other notable names, but these men are remembered as they were martyred in 1555. They were burned at the stake. Their heresy trial was a mockery, but these men spoke boldly. Ridley, a scholar, laid out his case systematically. Latimer, a preacher, shamelessly rebuked the false teaching of the church in Rome. Latimer wrote Ridley, and he said this, that when he was settled and steadfast in his own salvation, he was as bold as a lion. I believe that this alludes to Proverbs 28.1, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And this is what I want you to walk away with today, that as a result of your assurance in Christ Jesus, that you will be bold in your faith. We have every reason to be bold and zero to keep silent. We have every reason to stand firm and no reason to retreat. Paul writes, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. The Spirit explicitly or clearly says. Now, this is an interesting statement because we know that he has spoken clearly, but how, in what manner, and through whom or who? Don't know which one to use. Let's hope we pick the right one. But it's interesting to think about. Was it clear because this has been an established teaching and, and Paul is continuing this very clear and truthful teaching? We see in Acts chapter 20, looking at 29 through 30, is Paul simply continuing what he has taught before? I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. This may be. But what makes this even more interesting is, was this Paul's revelation or someone else's? Meaning, did the Spirit reveal this to Paul directly, or did God the Holy Spirit speak through another to reveal this to Paul? See, Paul traveled a lot with a man named Silas, and he had the gift of prophecy. We know this as according to Acts 15.32. Judas, not that guy, and Silas also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brothers and sisters with a lengthy sermon. See? Lengthy sermon. <laughs> they first began their travel together, and then they went up to the church in Jerusalem, and they were sent there uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch, actually, uh, to clear up confusion that was arising in the church. See, false teachings were a problem since the church's conception, but that's something that we'll address later on. But this is what makes this statement, the Spirit clearly says, so interesting. Was this clear message revealed to Paul? You see, Paul was not an unstoppable force. A remarkable man who served the kingdom of God using his gifts in an incredible way and in the name of Jesus. Absolutely. But he was not perfect. He was not untouchable. You see, Paul still needed those around him to use their gifts, their help, their purpose to accomplish his calling in his own life. It is possible that Silas prophesied this truth to Paul, but there's no doubt that during their time together, God spoke through Silas to Paul for his benefit, and Paul spoke through, or God spoke through Paul to Silas for his. They used their gifts alongside one another to fulfill their callings. 
And once again, as a church today, we need to recognize how essential it is that we all actively serve the kingdom of God through the spiritual gifts he's given us. But it seems like in the Western church, the vast majority of those in church on Sunday, they think that their spiritual gift is sitting in a pew. That is not a spiritual gift, ladies and gentlemen. A church that is filled with mere pew sitters is a church full of parasites who make the church and the the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, their host. Dear Christian, you will not experience the power of God, his presence in your life and in the body of Christ without exercising your spiritual gifts. Romans 12, 3 through 6. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we may, so we being many, are one in the body of Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Paul then goes on to list a few, encouraging the church to use their gifts. And so if you're here and you have no idea what your spiritual gifts are, come talk to me. I want to help you find your spiritual gifts so that you can then take those steps moving forward. Seeing where God has empowered you knowing what is available in just this body of believers to where you can serve the kingdom of God. I want you to serve and use your gifts. It is there that you are going to experience God to the fullest. But some of you know where God has empowered you. For some of you, he's, he's, in, he's get, empowered you with administration. You have the ability to see tasks through to the end. You are organized. You have the gift of exhortation. You have this incredible ability to encourage people that they would see where God is working in their life, even when they don't. This gift of evangelism, that you're able to speak to anyone and your passion to tell them about Jesus is the focus of your interaction. And the list goes on. Helping, hospitality, knowledge, and leadership are just a few. But this is why churches die. Because parasitic pews that take the life out of the church, and when the church has nothing left to give, the doors close. But God has not called the body of Christ, his church, to be life-sucking vampires. We just went through just three spiritual gifts, and every one of them, you can see how they're used to give life, to accomplish tasks, to be able to keep the church moving forward and in the right direction. They build people up. They build community. They care for people. See, either the church is moving or the church is dying. Even your doctors will tell you, when you stop moving, rest assured, it's going to go downhill. The same is true for the body of Christ. God has called each and every one of you to be a part of what he's doing In this world, he has called each of us to fulfill his calling of saving the souls of our family, of our neighbors, of our friend and even our friends and even our enemies. He's called you to be a part of that. And by not exercising your spiritual gifts, you are missing out on all that God is doing. All of it. You see, God does not function within a person. He ministers, he transforms, he empowers so that you would be sent out and impact others. The Christian faith has and will always be communal. We make up the body of Christ. God used Paul, but he did not just use Paul. He brought others alongside Paul so that he could help, so they could help him fulfill his calling in his life, and he can help fulfill their calling in theirs. He continues to write, in later times they will fall away from the faith. Now this opens up a theological can of worms. It's one that shouldn't divide the church. But in broad strokes, there are two primary camps that will help us in this portion of the sermon. The first camp is Arminianism. 
And this is a system, uh, this is a system of belief that attempts to explain the relationship between God's sovereignty and mankind's free will, especially in relation to salvation. The other camp is Calvinism, which emphasizes the sovereignty of God, the unconditional election of the saved, and the irresistible grace that saves a sinner. Here's what we're not going to do. I'm not going to sit up here and defend or deface one theological camp over another. I think they both have failings. These two views can help us to engage Scripture, but they cannot dictate what we take from Scripture. We need to let Scripture speak for itself. And so when we read a text like this that warns us of falling away, the common question that Christians may ask is, can you lose your salvation? Now the question is wrong from the start. I lose my keys. I lose my phone. Right, Rick? All the time. But see, the question insinuates something that Scripture doesn't teach at all. You lose things that you don't want to lose. And so the question itself is phrased in such a way as though you're going to somehow wake up one day and not find Jesus. That will never happen. You won't wake up one day and go, where did I put Jesus? It's not going to happen. But, there, but this is where some who lean towards the Arminian camp have failed. failed. Where's the assurance? This is where I struggled as a young Christian. And maybe you can relate. In fact, if you're here and you have struggled with this question or you know someone who has, I want to encourage you to raise your hand. And that is this, that if I were to die right now, I don't know if I would be in Christ. That from day to day, I don't have the confidence or assurance of my eternal salvation. Have you ever struggled with that? Has that ever crossed your mind? Okay, keep your hands up. I'm going to ask you to be bold here. Who here would say that I'm struggling with that right now? God bless you. Dear Christian, there is no greater assurance in life than our salvation in Christ. And it's because it all hinges upon what he has done. See, the cross of Jesus Christ is where he bore all of our sin. Not some of it, not up to this point, not up until when you repent, all. Every sin you would ever commit, every lie, every bit of your lust, your gossip, all of your sin was paid in full, was bore by Christ on that cross. God already has righteously punished your sin, all of your sin, and Christ bore that punishment for you. The reason why we struggle when we fall short is because our focus is still on ourselves. Christian, the reason why you even care, the reason you want to do what is right, to walk in righteousness, is because you're saved. But you're looking at this through the wrong lens. And so get your focus off of yourself and on Christ. For example, you see your sin and you hate it. Good. But then you immediately see yourself. You immediately look at where you've fallen short. You did it again. This same one once again or this brand new one. You found a new way to sin. You figured it out. And you just examine your life and go, it's just filled with this brokenness. That's where you're, that's where you're wrong. Let's play this back. You see your sin. You hate it. Good. But now focus on Christ. Because it's Him who took that sin and bore that sin and you cleave to His grace. You have no fear of His condemnation. You have no fear of His wrath because you know that all of it was poured out on Christ on your behalf and now as His son and daughter, you can freely approach Him. Sure, you're not going to be proud of your sin. I tell people this. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit does. Guilt is what Satan does. Guilt drives you away. When you feel guilty, what do you do? You isolate, you pull away, you avoid the person you feel guilty of. But what is conviction? Conviction is when the Holy Spirit says, hey, bring this back to me. 
It is a drawing towards Christ. It is a bringing you back. Whereas guilt is, run away. You can't show your face to God right now. How could you? That's of the devil. But conviction is a calling back. Come home, son. Come home, daughter. Let, I've, I've bore this. Don't let this separate us. That's the difference. And so when we fall short, we need to focus and look upon Christ and Christ alone because it's all because of what he has done that we are saved. Nothing in this world can compare to the confidence, the assurance we have in our salvation in Christ because our salvation hinges solely upon everything he has done and nothing that we are doing. Here's where the other camp it's one of those funny things that Les brought up the other day. The other day. He goes, I'm surprised you're not a Calvinist because all the preachers you listen to are. Some of my favorite Calvinist preachers, here's where they failed. Where are the warnings? Throughout Scripture, we're given warnings. And this is one of them. Why would Jesus warn us? Why would God, the Holy Spirit, speak through the writers of Scripture and warn us of falling away? Scripture is filled with both the assurance we have in Christ and the warning, do not fall away. But notice, it's not fall. It's fall away. Christian, you will fall. For all have sinned and fall short. You will fall. That does not risk any eternal security. But it does affect the health of your current fellowship with God at that moment. And that is why the Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us to the Father that we would cleave to the grace that he is offering. See, sin drives a wedge between us and God, but repentance eliminates that wedge. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Falling away is when a Christian returns to the yoke of slavery. This was kind of the foolish thing you see in the Exodus. They're free in the wilderness and food is sparse, but by golly, I'd rather go be a slave because my belly's full. Does that make any sense? That's what you see. That is falling away. And then what do they go and do? They, make a gold, they melt down all their gold and form a golden calf. When their heart falls away from Christ in worship, and they go and pursue and worship their sin. Worship is a key word here because worship is powerful. Worship defines who we are. Worship consumes us. We can worship our sin, our addiction, our lust, ourselves. We can worship another person. We can worship our career. We can worship our social status, money, and the list goes on. The world is filled with all kinds of false gods that want our worship. But a Christian is consumed in their worship of Christ. See, this is why when we fall, we recognize it because God the Holy Spirit convicts us. And we are drawn back to Christ knowing that there is no condemnation that waits for us. And we receive yet again his remarkable grace. We see this in Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because our condemnation was bore on Christ's shoulders. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How is he faithful and righteous in doing so? Because he paid for the sin already. He absorbed the debt already. But someone who has fallen away, they couldn't care less. Hebrews 10, 26 through 27. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Now one camp will say that, well, that's because they never were of Christ. They were never saved. While the other will say they knew Christ but, and they were saved, but they fell away. Here's where these camps have failed. You see, we can sit here and argue about semantics and get into a theological debate, or we can get going and go after that person who's separated from Christ. We can argue theology all day long, yet there's still somebody who needs Jesus, and we're the vessels to go to them. 
So instead of arguing these semantics, which is hindsight or whatever, let's go after people. Whether they were of Christ or never were or whatever, they fell away, we know they don't have them. So let's go after them. Christians have the greatest assurance of their salvation because of what Scripture teaches. We are assured because of everything Christ has done for us. In addition, Scripture also warns us of apostasy. People leaving the faith, falling away. Whether or not they were ever saved, not, I really don't care. What is for sure is they need Jesus now. So let's go after him. But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter days, times will come where they will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Christians, there are more false teachings than there are sound teaching in the world. I was talking to a pastor friend, and he says, it seems like so much of what I do is tell my congregation, no. Not this person. No, don't listen to them. Why? Because there's a plethora of false teachings out there. Satan is bombarding this world with various kinds of false teaching. One popular one is that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. Well, that works great here in America where we're consumed with money and power. But that's, that false gospel is still being peddled in third world countries. It's still desirable. But it's kind of funny because if God wants me to be healthy and wealthy, well, then Paul never heard that because when God called Paul in Acts 9.16, this is what God said. For I will show him how much he must suffer in behalf of my name. We are promised one thing in this world. God promises us one thing, and that is persecution. Jesus says in Matthew 10, first part of verse 22, it says, You will be hated by all because of my name. We also see in 1 Peter 5, 10, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And we haven't gotten to 2 Timothy yet, that's coming, but 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul writes to Timothy again, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Christian, if you're living out your faith and you have little to zero resistance, you're not living loud enough. Trust me, you haven't cracked a code. So you might think every Christian throughout history has been persecuted in one way or another. The vast majority have been under, under extreme persecution. But you found a way to live with none? That's why the Bible warns us. Live out your faith with the same boldness that our brothers and sisters in Christ have as they spilled their blood for the sake of the gospel. So what they make fun of you? So what your HR gets called, it calls you in. So what you get blocked on social media. Live out your faith and stand firm in the truth at, because that is what Christ has called us to do, that we would stand firm in the truth no matter what. Put it all on the line because ha souls hang in the balance. Eternity is at stake. And God became flesh, bore our sins, conquered our grave, not so that we would keep silent, but proclaim this incredible truth to the world. Matthew 10, 27, Jesus says this to his disciples. What I tell you in the darkness, tell in the light. And what, I, what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. This brings us back to our assurance. Our boldness springs forth because we know who has saved us. Men and women stood upon their assurance and proclaimed the gospel despite the danger. Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Christian, this world has nothing that should cause us to fear anything that should prevent us from living out our faith loudly. Our faith is to be lived out loud with zero fear. Because what can this world honestly do? Take my job? 
The Lord will provide. He, I have a church that I can cleave to, that they will bear my burdens with me. Take my freedom? Good. I've always wanted a prison ministry. Take my life? Good. I'd rather be with Jesus anyway. What does the world have to strike fear in us? Nothing. So why are we so silent? Why are we not itching to leave this fellowship and tell someone about our incredible Savior? Christian, why are you still sitting on the sidelines when God has empowered you with gifts and the greatest news this world could ever hear? Yeah, you and I are broken vessels, but we know the one true living God who restores those who are broken, who redeems the unredeemable, who loves the unlovable and saves those who think they're unsavable. Nothing is impossible for God. So go. Go resting in the assurance of your salvation in Christ Jesus and live your faith out loud. Put it all on the line as Christ did. Because those who are lost, that's exactly what's hanging in the balance. Everything. So live out loud, Christian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for preserving this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. That we can read this and we can be spurred by it. That we would live out our faith with boldness. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you. Or if there's anyone here who's wrestling with this. They truly care about their relationship with you. And they're struggling with this fact of, of feeling like they're, they're not assured. That they have no confidence in it. I pray, Father, that during this time of invitation, they would come forward and allow us to minister to them that they would see a little bit clearer your faithfulness, your long-suffering, that we could truly have, have the greatest confidence in our salvation knowing that it's because of you that we are saved. That as we move forward and we fall short, we recognize and understand that you knew this, and that's why you bore it. You knew we would be a work in progress. You knew our lives were gonna be messy. But how amazing is it that you still bore that cross, that you would adopt us as sons and daughters, knowing our past, knowing our future, and still saying, I want you as a son, and I want you as a daughter. What a beautiful image that we can cleave to. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that they would know and accept this remarkable grace that you've given. But I pray now, Lord, that as we leave this place, that you would give us the boldness that we would rest in our assurance and be, and we wouldn't be afraid of rejection. We wouldn't be afraid of what people might say. We wouldn't be afraid of anything, but that we would know that in this, this moment, I need to say something, and we would live our faith out loud. Lord, use this church to live out loud in Morristown. It's in Jesus' name we pray.